everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I am Christine Gould, the a and rep here in Chicago, and today our workshop is about all things plants. We're joined by our friends at Coach House Plants based here in Chicago. Um, if you've ever been to our showroom, whether you're local or have come through uh, for Neocon in previous years, you've probably already seen their amazing work. So their studio offers interior plant design services for businesses and homes, and they collaborate with designers, architects, businesses, and homeowners alike. It's owned by husband-wife duo, Michael and Pat, and they will be joining us from their brand new shop in the North Center neighborhood for the locals. Um, we will be recording this call and sharing the session with all of the attendees, um, so you will get a copy, and we encourage everyone to use the chat i um, sure there'll be lots of questions, so we'll definitely be leaving time for that at the end. So with that, we are going to stop sharing our screen and turn it over to them. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everybody. I will start sharing my screen now. And... All right. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, we are Mike and Kat. I'm Kat. I'm Mike. <laughs> and our plant shop is in Chicago. Um, we're located in the North Center neighborhood at Western and Grace. So if you're local, please stop by. Uh, we just opened our doors this past weekend. Uh, we have a great collection of plants and planters. We also have flowers and a ton of plant care tools. So we've got you covered from anything that we'll cover in this presentation. So come <clears> see <throat> us live um, and we'll be happy to have you. But this presentation is gonna cover a lot of basic information. Um, it is Plant Care 101. So we're gonna go from what plants need to survive and thrive, um, how you can select plants for your home, what's appropriate for light levels, um, how to water plants appropriately, and how to sty style and stage plants in your home so that it looks chic and nice yeah. and not like a hodgepodge. How to pick out the right plants and pots for your home. Yep. So without further ado, the basic thing that all plants need is sunlight and water. Uh, there's nothing fancier that I can tell you about that. Um, different plants need different levels of sunlight and different plants need different levels of water. Uh, we'll cover off on some basics, some need to knows, but uh, there's no exact formula, which is probably the most frustrating thing for beginners. Uh, a lot of people come into our shop and have approached us at our clients. Uh, how much should I be watering my plant? And it's, it's tricky because there's no correct. There's no exact answer to that. Um, so we'll get to water shortly enough, but first we'll get to light. So when I first started taking care of plants professionally, I had no idea what direct sunlight, indirect sunlight, bright, low, moderate looked like. Um, but the best way I can think about it and describe it is to think of a room with wide windows that has light streaming in. So anything that is right up against that window, so in this photo, it would be on that right-hand side. Anything that's right at that window has bright, direct sunlight. Anything that's further into the room, so around that number two by that armchair and between that sofa and armchair, that's bright, indirect. So you're not feeling the actual warmth of the sun, but it, there's still light there. Medium light would be um, not quite too dark and not quite bright. So it's kind of in between. And a low light area is usually a hallway or a deep corner, something that's furthest away from the windows and that um, does not ever get any direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that? No, no, it's, that's perfect. This picture perfectly uh, depicts um, what classification you would you would need to kind of follow if you're picking out plants for your for your home? Yeah, so just think about this beautiful room um, and when you're thinking about light levels. So, a good tip when we're talking about light before you even buy a plant, assess the light levels in your home and research plants um, and research their their required light levels. So that brings a sort of intention to your purchasing. So you're not just kind of flailing about a plant store and just buying whatever looks 
cool or looks the best. But but you should just buy cool plants. Cool plants at too shop. at this shop. <laughs> yes, we really recommend that. Uh, anyway, but yeah. just know where you're gonna put it ahead of time. Yeah, or where know you where plan you're gonna, on putting it. Yeah, know where you're gonna put it ahead of time, and that benefits you in the long run because you're gonna bring home something that is actually gonna survive and not die, and you won't feel bad about yourself yes. in the end. Uh, so this is the million dollar question. How much do I water my plants? Like I said, there is no answer to that. And when I tell people that they get, they get like a look on their face that is just so disappointed, but it's a, it's a fine balance. So as a, as a plant gets more sunlight, it's gonna need more water. Likewise, when it gets less sunlight, it's gonna need less water. Um, the best way, the best analogy that I've heard recently was um, humans, you're recommended eight glasses of water. Um, I, I don't always do that. Uh, Michael always does that. Yes. <laughs> but sometimes you're good with six and you feel totally fine. And sometimes, you know, you need 10, 14, 15 cups of water. Um, plants are much like that too. It depends on the season. Um, what the weather is like outside. Is it overcast? Is it bright and sunny? Is it hot outside? Is it cold outside? Um, you'll get to know your plants over time and those levels will adjust also over time. So yeah. uh, the, the tip here is to start paying attention to your plants. Your plants, much like us, uh, we have thirst cues. We get a dry mouth or, you know, we just know that you're thirsty. Um, plants show cues as well. So droopy leaves um, obviously indicates underwatered plants. So start paying attention to your plants and start paying attention to the moisture level in the soil. And once you kind of keep an eye on that and regularly water plants, you'll learn your plants cues. Um, but when you're watering, there are a couple of rules of thumb. Um, when you are watering a plant, go slow. Um, don't just dump all of the water into the plant. It'll come gushing out and it won't uh, pass on its benefits to your plants in the way that it should. So go slow and make sure you're going away around the whole perimeter of the pot, making sure that you're getting the full area of the soil um, and getting it evenly. So that will distribute the water all the way around the plant and down to the roots evenly. And that is the key for long-term success when you're watering your plants. And also use uh, lukewarm water as well. Um, it just helps the roots uh, absorb a little bit more moisture. Yeah, well, plants get shocked with cold water. So make sure that it's, it's a nice temperature. Um, and when you're watering, make sure that you stick to a schedule. So our plants here in the shop, they we obviously have a wide variety of plants in the shop. So they're all kind of on different schedules, but at home or at our clients, like at the national showroom, we have a bi-weekly or every other, every two week bi schedule. Yeah. Bi-monthly, uh, bi -monthly, bi weekly yes. And so we water the plants at our clients um, locations every 10 to 14 days. That regularity, uh, has the plant in a schedule and the, the soil adjusts to retaining moisture to that schedule. So plants are resilient and they learn a schedule. So as long as you stick to it, um, your plants should adjust over time. And so when you are watering, going around the full perimeter of the plant, covering the full area, the best rule of thumb is to water slowly and until you see water coming out of the bottom of your grow pot. Would you hand me that plant here? Mm -hmm. So when you're watering, we'll cover how to stage a plant later in the presentation, but when you're watering, this is a, a grow pot that you see here. This is what your plant comes in when you buy it. And when you're watering, you wanna water slowly and until you see water coming out of these little tiny holes at the bottom. That means it's got, the water's gone through the full length of the plant, through the full depth, and reached the top roots, the bottom roots, and the middle roots all evenly. Once the water is coming out of the bottom of the grow pot, make sure that you allow that plant to sit in either your sink or just sit in the pot, in the decorative pot itself for about 30 minutes. Come back and check on the plant itself and make sure that there's no water sitting at the bottom of the pot. 
if there's water sitting at the bottom of the pot after you water your plant, it's just going to be sitting in that moisture. And that is a recipe for all sorts of pests or root rot in general, just not good for the plant itself. So that is kind of the, the overview of watering. I think um, you learn through mistakes, you learn through trial and error. Um, Mike and I have definitely killed our fair share of plants, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. I'm so sorry. It just happens. <laughs> it just happens. Um, and don't, don't beat yourself up about it. Um, the more plants you kill, the more you learn. And um, sooner or later, you will get it down pat. You'll learn your plants as well as the back of your hand. But when you are choosing a plant for your home or for your office for that matter, uh, like I said before, buy with intention. So assess the space first. Um, don't, it's, it's, it's not great to just go to a plant shop and buy whatever you see. Have a plan in mind. That way you're buying something specifically for a specific area in your home and you know what that plant needs or you know what, what environment you're providing for that plant. So once you have that area zeroed in, assess the light levels. I mean, this can be quick. It doesn't have to be, you know, a scientific method, but you just assess the light levels with your eyes. It's as simple as that. And check if you see, if you have direct light, indirect light, low light, high light, all of that. And then research that light level and pick a plant according to the light level that you have. Um, and keep in mind, starting easy is key. There's no shame in choosing an easy or a beginner plant. All plants are lovely, all plants grow and serve a purpose. So start easy, go slow. Don't go for the crazy tropicals or you know weirdo plants at first. You'll get there, I promise. Um, but just make sure that you're at your comfort level and you're set up for success. So choosing a plant, our favorite beginner plants are these here on the screen. Um, Sansevieria snake plants here in that pink bubble. Those are just road warriors. They will survive in low light, medium light. They're not so much high light, but they'll they'll survive. Um, they're easy watering schedule, so you can water. You know, you can forget to water a few times on those, and they'll forgive you. They're also just structural and beautiful, and they come in a variety of colors, so you can really mix it up. It's not just a basic plant. Um, ZZ plant, a lot of people know these plants. They're also lower light. They're also really forgiving if you forget to water them a few times. Uh, they bounce back and they retain water really well. So super great beginner plants. They're also really beautiful. The leaves are super waxy and just gorgeous and shiny. So that's a great beginner plant. My my personal favorite is a bird's nest fern. So it's the most right plant that you're seeing. Uh, they're just fun and frilly and they bounce right back if they kind of get too droopy suddenly. So they're super easy. They're the plant that I, I learned how to take care of plants with and it has a special place in my heart. So that's my favorite. Um, rounding out this selection, we have a rubber tree or a rubber plant, also super easy, also super versatile with the light levels. Um, it, you can practically stick it anywhere in your home and it'll do okay, except for a closet. Maybe don't right, stick yeah. it in the closet. <laughs> um, but the rubber tree, it, it blooms, the new leaves come out as these like red furled up leaves and they unfurl into this like deep purple color and they're just so elegant and so, so easy to take care of. Um, and lastly, we have our Hartley philodendron. These grow crazy quick, so you can feel super accomplished um, sooner rather than later. And they're also super easy, super forgiving and super flexible on light levels. So if you're looking somewhere for somewhere to start, this is a great place, um, but do your own research, look at the plants online. There's tons of resources that you can tap into nowadays. And um, lots of people are recommending plants everywhere from the internet to Instagram, to even TikTok. So I'm sure you can find information somewhere if you just 
look hard yeah, enough. An, another thing I want to mention too, if you um, if you're not in Chicago and you're going into another plant shop, if you if you like any of these plants that you see, um, they also come in so many different varieties. So you might be able to like the the binding plant at the bottom left. It's a type of philodendron, and it it is it comes in so many different varieties. So um, the the plant world is is huge, and there's tons of different colors and shapes, and um, there's far more easy plants to take mm -hmm. care of than hard plants. Yes, yeah, the world is your oyster when it comes to beginner plants. So just stop at your local plant shop we know of one yeah you can always come here <laughs> and you can ask us and we'll guide you through um so i'm sure any any cities that you're in there are tons of plant shops now popping up and plant people are usually fairly nice so <laughs> also you can just ask a human instead right. of googling it yeah. hey guys quick question for you before we go to the next slide just um and i know we're going to do some q a here sure. at the end but just since we have a couple slide specific questions um, we have someone asking just a clarification on which plant it is that's in the taupe bubble up on the top. Taupe bubble up at the top. That is a ZZ plant. Easy ZZ. Okay. okay. And then we have one other question too specific um, to the slide. Are any of these poisonous to pets? Yes. So the majority of these plants are fairly poisonous to plants or pets. Um, it's best to do your own research in terms of what pet you have. Um, and what plant you're looking to buy. Um, but yeah, if you nibble on a plant or if a cat nibbles on a plant, it's it's going to get queasy. So it's best to to do your own research on that one. Yeah, it, it is um, it, it is nearly impossible though to recommend like, I, I think there's a few and I'm sorry, I can't mm -hmm. place the names right now, but it basically, if you're looking for a plant, uh, a pet friendly plant, it limits your options down to like only a few. So if if your animal, if you suspect your animal to eat the entire plant, then I would absolutely look for a pet friendly plant. But if your pet is going to maybe nibble a little mm. bit, then you should be okay. Um, uh, Kat and I both have, um, we have two cats at home and uh, one of them absolutely nibbles quite a bit and you clean up some puke here and there, but um, yeah, it's not that often. The ASPCA website is a great resource to go to. They have a comprehensive list of plants that are poisonous to pets and plants that are safe for pets. So I recommend going to that site. They have a great list of, of pet safe plants. Awesome, thank you guys. Cool. Um, so we're going to go through some common issues. So these are our last two slides, and then we're going to show you how to style a plant um, like a professional. Just some words of wisdom, yeah. Yes. So common issues, classic common issue is underwatering, overwatering. Um, this one is still super frustrating to me because it happens all the time. You can underwater, overwater a plant any given day. Um, that's that's the, the light water balance that I was talking at, about at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so the best rule of thumb or the best kind of like cue for underwatering and overwatering. So when you're underwatering a plant, uh, the leaf will brown or yellow, but you'll notice that it's getting rigid and crispy. So a crispy brown leaf means that you're underwatering. Um, you can also check the soil. So if the soil is sandy or just super bone dry, you're definitely underwatering a plant. Likewise, when you're overwatering a plant, uh, the leaves will also turn brown and yellow. So that's like a, a really super clear <laughs> indicator. Yeah, it, um, it's very confusing. It's it they turn yellow and brown. Yes. So when you're overwatering, um, if you're paying close attention to leaves, which you would have to be staring at your plant all day every day but the leaves kind of get bloated so they're super um i mean they just get bloated and they they turn yellow and brown from the inside out so you'll notice kind of specks of of browning in the middle of a leaf um that has a yellow kind of halo around it uh so that's kind of uh, it, your plant is indicating that it's getting so much water into its leaves, it's bruising from the inside out. Um, and 
this like kind of a second layer of indication is always checking that soil. So if your plant is browning and it's really holding on to moisture, or if your soil is still moist uh, for a while after you've watered it, it's probably overwatered. Uh, so a good troubleshooting technique for overwatering, underwatering, I mean, underwatering, just water your plant. Um, there's no trick to that. Uh, just water your plant thoroughly, make sure that it's fully drained and put it back into its decorative pot. If you're overwatering, let that thing dry out for a good week or two. Let the soil completely dry out so that it's bone dry. Once it's bone dry, give it a thorough watering, but let it drain. So if you have a smaller plant, water it at the sink and let it drain. If you have a bigger plant, and it's in a floor pot, um, make sure when you're watering it to peek into the pot itself and make sure that there's no actual excess water there. So yeah, um, my best advice is to actually like on underwater your plants more than if you if you're a heavy water, um, you're gonna kind of run into you're gonna run into problems with getting um, fungus gnats. Um, it, uh, it can kind of cause some mold, um, really the, the best case is always to just sort of like give it a little bit less. Um, if it's underwater, you'll, you'll definitely see the, the leaves are kind of droopy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, just, um, really strong advice is to just do not give it tons and tons of water frequently. Um, keep it on a schedule. Um, yeah. whether it's once a week or once every other week. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. that goes right back to that regularity that we talked about earlier. 10 to 14 days is our personal rule, um, but you can, if you're watering less and more frequently, that also works. Uh, consistency is key. So uh, just make sure that you're watering your plant at a consistent amount of time. So if you're doing every seven days, keep to that schedule. If you're doing every 10 days, keep to that schedule. So the next, common issue is compacted soil. And this is really common because we tend to have a set it and forget it approach to plants. Once you've watered it, you're good. You're good to go, which usually is, is, is accurate. Usually that's okay. You can set it and forget it, water it and go. But over time, when you're watering your plants regularly, um, the soil kind of gets compacted down. So uh, as, as water is draining, gravity works. So it kind of just gets pressured, pressurized into this, like kind of just compacted. Yeah. It's like a big clumps yes. at the top of the pot. Yep. And so that's an issue because then air, so oxygen and carbon dioxide can't get all the way down to those bottom and middle roots. Um, and roots do need air. Um, they're underneath the soil, but they do need air. Um, so aeration, soil aerating is very important. Um, you can do it with something as simple as, um, I mean, I guess I have a Sharpie in my pocket, but you can get a Sharpie and you just stick it in the soil around the perimeter of a plant. Yeah, um, I, I would, yeah, I would look for something, um, like a pencil, something yeah, something, thinner. something don't, don't use a Sharpie. I'm sorry. Yes. Do not use a Sharpie. Something thinner um, than yeah, a Yeah, use like a, a coffee, a coffee stir, something thin and kind of long and mm -hmm. skinny and just kind of work the the prod um, sort of like all around the, the plant and just break up like any clumps of soil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, things that I've used as soil aerators have included coffee stir, <laughs> yeah, chopsticks, coffee stirs. We've um, used a, all these a things. Butter things. knife. Um, just yeah. be careful. That, yeah, just don't. Um, when you're really like stabbing in the soil, you just you do want to be careful that you're not like destroying all the roots along the way. So something just kind of thin and um, and long, and that is really suggested to break up the soil mm -hmm. um, once a month, um, even if you do it once every other month. But if, if you don't aerate your soil, um, your, your, your plant plants, is just not going to be happy. They're not going to like you. Yeah. yeah. Um, aerating allows water to travel all the way through. So it's not kind of just following some sort of uh, predetermined pattern that it's been taking, you know, every watering. Uh, so it's really just a two second step that you add in, like Mike said, once, once a month. Um, and one last tip on aeration so that you're careful not to destroy the roots it's best to keep on the outermost perimeter of your pot 
um, and just go gently, go slow, and go as deep as the pot allows. And um, once you start doing that, it really does make a difference. It's like a pro tip. Uh, and it's amazing how quickly plants bounce back if you aerate the soil and give yeah, it they'll, water. Yeah, they'll drink a little bit more water. Um, it, the, yeah, it just retains a little bit more moisture once you break up the, the soil. Um, another issue that we run into a lot is root rot. And this is um, kind of a mysterious issue that people run into because they're kind of afraid of investigating their soil itself. But that is root rot is a result of overwatering. Um, so it happens when your plant is sitting in water. Uh, and that's why drainage and making sure that there's no excess water at the bottom of your pot um, after you water something uh, is super, super vital. Um, making sure that there's no excess moisture obviously allows a plant to fully dry out between waterings and reduces the risk of root rot. Um, if you do have root rot, usually you can notice it by the leaves. It it's, looks just like overwatering usually. Um, leaves are yellowing and browning and they're not so much crispy as they are um, more pliable. Uh, so they'll gradually lose color and it just looks, your plant looks, starts to look dull um, essentially. So to combat that, again, just fully let your plant dry out between waterings, um, maybe add a few extra days. If you're on a 10 day schedule, maybe add four extra days. So it's a 14 day break between waterings mm -hmm. so that that soil gets fully dried out. Um, and the last common issue here that we want to cover is dusty leaves. This is also something that people often overlook, um, including ourselves at our home. But <laughs> dusty leaves attract all sorts of pests um, that we'll cover in the next slide, which I have to warn you guys is kind of a graphic slide, but I've done my best to to find the most, the least graphic photos of these pests. But um, dusty leaves just attract pests like spider mites, um, scale, uh, and mealybugs, which are just, they suck. They suck the, the life out of your plant um, right on the leaf and dust is just like their happy place. So to dust a plant, you could do it once a month, once every other month. Um, but you take warm water and some simple dish soap, whatever you're using at home is just fine. Um, mix it up in a, in a bowl or a bucket and dip um, a towel into that water and just wipe down every leaf that you see that there's dust on, even if there's no visible dust on it, just give it a good wipe um, and your plants will thank you for it in the long run. Also misting, um, if, if you're uh, just misting like once a week or once every other week. That also helps um, eliminate some dust that's gathered on the leaves. Um, but yeah, if you use like a little bit of dish, so like just a drop of dish soap in, in a bowl of water, um, dilute it, um, wipe down the leaves. The leaves will also just look like way more vibrant mm -hmm. in, in green. Um, so yeah, it's, it allows them to absorb more sunlight uh, and it's, it's yeah, it, it's amazing how much different your plant will look if you give it a bath. Mm -hmm. One more thing that's not on this slide but we do get questions about often is pruning. Um, pruning is a trial and error process. It's like getting um, bangs impulsively. Once you get bangs and they don't look good, you learn to never get bangs ever again, or at least not that type of bang. Um, but if you trim back leaves or fronds on your plant and it looks just like not right, it'll grow back. I promise it'll grow back. It's not gone forever. Um, and uh, you'll slowly just learn how to kind of shape a plant so that it looks um, it's best. Over yeah. Time. And, and if you're, um, if your plant is looking overgrown, just there's tons of videos online, look for your, you know, how to prune a, you know, ficus tree mm -hmm. or just, um, you can you, get very specific down to the type of plant. And I'm, I assure you, there is a video of someone pruning that yes, specific plant. Yes. So if it, if it looks like, you know, it's growing in a weird direction or lopsided, mm -hmm. you might need to prune it. Um, or you might also, um, just the last, last tip, it, again, this one's not on, on the slide, but um, sometimes you have to rotate your, your plant. Um, you know, let's say this is like facing the, the, let's say this is facing the window. This side starts to grow towards the, 
it starts to grow towards the light. So you kind of have to give it a 360 turn. 180. Or sorry, one, wow, it's been a long day. 180. Um, yeah, 360 would put it just right back right where back it was. Yeah, that's right really up, yeah. stupid of mm -hmm. me. Okay, so just turn it, turn it 180 degrees. Yep. Um, to even so that, it out. Yeah, so that its backside is now facing the sun. So you just really want to get in a habit of giving every side of the plant some loving. Yeah. Um, so again, next slide kind of gross, but I think it's very informative because a lot of people experience these pest issues and they don't necessarily know how to identify them because they are so sneaky. So um, here are the most common pests that we see in our practice. Um, they range from fungus gnats to scale. Fungus gnats look exactly like fruit flies. Um, they come out of your plants um, and you can either bring them into your home from produce, from, um, you know, just walking in and a gust comes into your home and a fungus gnat flies in and they find the perfect soil that they want to lay their eggs in and it just multiplies like crazy. So fungus gnats are attracted to moist soil. And if you notice one of your plants is especially natty, um, dry that plant out just like overwatering and root rot just dry that plant out and it really um makes the environment for the fungus gnats in the soil and the pot uninhabitable and they die off and that should take care of your problem on a first stage if you dry it out so once you're drying it out also um, we recommend spraying your plant down with insecticidal soap there are many types mm -hmm. many varieties um, we really like bonide products. Um, so if you spray your plant down with insecticidal soap from, from the tip of the leaf down to the soil, just spray everything that you see here. Um, it will kill off any sort of larva, any live um, flies or gnats that you see. And um, that'll be a sort of like first step. Um, uh, oh, sorry. An, an, another thing I want to say for um, fungus gnats is these, um, it's these yellow sticky traps. Um, the fungus gnats are, are attracted to yellow. Um, and yeah, if you notice that you have a plant at home that has just tons of fungus gnats flying around and you're, you're like in a bind, um, these yellow sticky traps really help um, attract the, the gnats very quickly. So mm -hmm. def definitely really recommend that. And then if it's really bad, um, yes. you, you can uh, put some coarse play sand um, and just do a layer on, on, the, on the soil. On and the that, top layer of on, soil. Yeah, the top layer of soil, and that really helps stop the fungus gnats from flying around. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the one-on-one -on, -one on fungus gnats, but mealybugs are super tricky, um, and I find that most people don't know to look out for them. So mealybugs are usually found on the underside of leaves and on the stalk part of leaves. And they look kind of like white fluffy mold or just cotton that has gotten stuck on your plant itself. Um, the best way to combat mealybugs, and this is kind of an approach if you see one or two, if your entire plant is covered in mealybugs, it's lay gone. it to rest and just say your prayers, it's gone. It it's, can, it's yeah. It's just not and, worth it because the mealybugs bounce from the plant to the pot to the wall that it's you know near mealybugs are truly like yeah they will to get rid of they will um yeah if it, if it has me really bad mealybugs it can travel to other plants and infect every plant yes. in the home so, so you, step one with mealybugs is to quarantine the plant remove the plant from your other plants um check all the plants it was around for the mealybugs as well and just kind of quarantine them all together um, take a Q-tip or a cotton pad or a paper towel and dip it in a little bit of um, rubbing alcohol and just wipe each mealybug off as you see it. Um, my personal favorite is Q-tip because it keeps distance from the actual mealybug itself. Um, so wipe all the mealybugs off. Once you've wiped them off with the rubbing alcohol, spray it down, spray the entire plant down from tip to soil. Um, <clears throat> with insecticidal soap uh, and just let it dry out for the course of two weeks um, and 
over that course of two weeks when, while it's drying out, you may need to go back in with the insecticidal soap every so often and maybe do another run through with the rubbing alcohol um, because like I said, they're really hard to get rid of, but um, with you know regimented schedule of attacking them, you can save your favorite plant. Um, but in the end, you know, if you're if you've got an infection on a plant, you can just lay it to rest. If it's um, bad. If it's bad. If it's really, really bad. Um, so spider mites and scale are combated the same way with the sort of rubbing alcohol Q-tip method and then spraying down with insecticidal soap, letting your plant dry out. But I just wanted to point out how spider mites and scale look. Spider mites kind of make a, um, a web that you can notice if you take a close look at the underside of your leaf or like the stocky part of your leaf. So they'll often make a web between two stalks that you can really notice. Um, but if you see those, uh, you can rub them off with a little bit of um, rubbing alcohol and then dry it out. Uh, scale looks like uh, a wart, honestly. It, they don't move at all. They just kind of stick to the underside of your leaf and they suck the life right out of your leaves. Um, and again, rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip, if you see one, just rub it right off and spray down with insecticidal soap. Um, with all of these, except for the fungus gnats, with all of these, it's important to kind of remove the plant from the rest of your plants so that the, the, the pests don't kind of jump from plant to plant. So that covers our kind of slideshow portion, but um, I wanted to show you guys um, before we go into questions and answers, the difference between a staged plant and an unstaged plant. So sometimes you buy a plant that fits perfectly into its pot. Um, we always recommend keeping your plant as you buy them, keep them in their grow pots. Um, it makes it really easy to drop into a planter. And if you do have to water your plant, which you will, um, you can just pull it out, take it to the sink and water it at the sink. Sometimes they fit perfectly and it looks Great. It looks like it's planted looks natural. Right in. You can't see anything from the top, and it's just a match made in heaven. Um, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you have a plant that's much smaller than your actual decorative pot, and it looks just kind of sad. So like it's there's no support there. It looks floppy. Let's say you love this pot and you love this plant, and you want them to go together and you will accept no other answer. So we have a trick that we're gonna show you today. This is pro level, this is industry secret. You're not allowed to tell anyone that we told you. <laughs> um, but basically what you're gonna do is you're going to create a little bit of a false bottom or a sort of um, platform inside your pot. Uh, we've used two saucers. They're uh, stuck together with some floral uh, tack. I guess that you can say it's it's called cling. Um, you can also use um, you can use like styrofoam. Just don't use any like paper or cardboard mm -hmm. because it'll attract more moisture and yes. bugs. So just use a like I don't want non-porous material. Yeah, non-porous. Um, so we stick that in here, and also so you'll see we have a saucer facing upwards. So this will catch the water, the excess water as it runs off when you're planting your pot or when you're watering your plant, it catches the water. Um, once you've let your plant drain, you can check this saucer. If there is excess, excess water, just pull the plant out, dump the water out, put the plant back in, put it in your pot. Um, okay, so you have a little bit of a platform. You're gonna put your plant here in the platform and now it's upright. It's upright and it's proud and it's tall and it looks good, kind of. Um, <laughs> and it's upright, so now we have added a little bit of Spanish moss here, you'll see. Um, this just covers the gap between the actual grow pot and the decorative pot itself. And it makes it look like it's planted directly in and nobody will, no one will be none the wiser. And it's now, I mean, if we compare the two, we have a very sad floppy plant that is too deep in the pot and one very regal, beautiful staged plant that is ready to be presented in your home. 
Um, so that is our very pro pro tip. Um, and that basically concludes what we wanted to present, but we also want to open to some questions. Um, we always get a ton of questions, so we're happy to answer if there are any questions. Um, if there are not at this time, feel free to stop in the shop. We're happy to have a full on conversation about anything related to plants um, because we do this for a living and we love it. So Christine, if there are any questions. Yeah, you guys, thank you so much. That was, I was writing notes, um, like the, just the little stuff, like the lukewarm water. And I had no idea I should have started dusting my fiddle leaf fig <laughs> <laughs> months ago. Um, so this has been super informative and we do have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm actually going to, and I actually, um, some common ones here, um, before I skip all the way back to the beginning were on drainage. So some people have said, what if I have a large plant, you know, in a pot without holes or if it's potted directly into a decorative planter? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing, um, when you have a planter that is already established and there's a plant planted directly in it, um, it's best to kind of start from scratch. So let it dry out and then um, slowly water it over. So when you're watering it, slowly water it. Um, use Mike's trick of underwatering it versus overwatering it. Um, that's when you have a plant that's already been planted and there's no turning back. But if you wanna take an extra step um, or if you're, are, if you're buying a new plant that is let's say a floor plant um, and you wanna plant it directly in versus putting that grow pot in its decorative container, which we always recommend because if you do have the unfortunate loss of a plant, it's easy to just swap it out. But if you need to plant something directly in, which by the way is just personal preference. If you would prefer to plant directly in, go right ahead, but make sure that you add a layer of drainage rocks. So that could be pebbles, like driveway pebbles, or in the shop we have horticultural charcoal, which is very pinkies up fancy, or you can put a layer of sand at the bottom, just so that you have um, a place to catch that water and take it away from those roots that are the most bottom roots. Yeah, what if it if your plant is planted directly in the container and you water it and you give it a ton of water, um, you're gonna have water just sitting at the bottom of that pot, and it it it'll it'll smell, it'll attract bugs. Yeah, all of that water has to to um, go. It has to travel all the way up through the plant again. So when you do have a plant that's planted directly in a container, um, really water it like in terms of like volume of water, give it far less water than you would with other mm -hmm. plants because it's gonna have more moisture in that container long-term compared to another plant that's not planted directly in. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, another question, this might be um, in a similar vein. Um, someone is asking, they have terracotta pots have been getting white mold. Um, they make sure not to overwater is this something that should be a concern. So oh. the white crust on the outside of a terracotta pot, if it's on the outside of a terracotta pot, that's usually not mold. It's usually um, the nutrients from the soil. Terracotta is very, very porous. Um, you'll notice when you water a plant in a terracotta pot, it'll kind of show where the water line is. So the white is not necessarily mold. It's just nutrients coming out of the soil through the terracotta pot. Um, and kind of just sticking themselves, they evaporate. So the water evaporates and the nutrients is, nutrients in the soil is what's left over. If, yeah, if you want a like squeaky clean, brand new terracotta pot, then I would, I would recommend just um, like never planting it, never planting the plant directly into the terracotta then, just leave it in its plastic nursery pot and just drop it in and the, the Terracotta will look just brand new because it won't have had absorbed that uh, water. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay, quick, actually, um, before we move on to the next question, because this might help with the um, the viewing, if you're able to actually stop sharing your presentation, because I think yeah, depending sure. on the view mode, that might um, allow people to see both screens. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so a question on fiddly figs, which I know are, are very popular. Um, someone recently trimmed the extra branches and placed uh, the single stems in water and it actually developed roots. What do they do next? Um, 
So it, I guess it depends on um, how developed the roots are. If uh, let's say if, if you just have like one little hairy root coming out, I, I would wait until you know it's the, there's like several very visible roots um, if it's propagating in water. Um, and uh, you know if you if you really want this this branch to uh, develop and grow it into its own tree, um, I would. Um, I would take the time to Google uh, the exact soil combination you'll want to use. Um, when, when, you're, when you're going to plant that in soil, don't just go to Home Depot and grab the Joe Schmo bag of, of soil. Um, if you've gone through the trouble of propagating this, this branch, then, then absolutely look up like the proper soil to use for, um, for that fiddle leaf fig. And yeah, just make sure that there's enough visible roots before you, before you put it in that soil. And, oh, and actually the, the last thing too, um, uh, the, the, the propagated branch, um, do not put that in like a massive, container. Um, if you if, if it's like a tiny little branch and you're putting it in, in like a, a giant planter, um, it's going to be it's just like swimming in an open ocean. You kind of have to like start small and work your way up. Yeah. So with that branch, try, try to find like a smaller a smaller pot and let the let it really develop more roots in the soil and then just keep going mm -hmm. up and up and up in the container sizes. Yeah, and one more thing about that too, once you transplant it into the new soil, um, make sure to keep the soil, and this is again that over underwatering conundrum, but make sure to keep the soil a little bit more moist um, as the roots kind of develop because it has been sitting in a cup of water. So it's used to like 1000% moisture. So yeah. just kind of like wean it off of that water. And um, like Mike said, start small and grow big. That's actually a perfect lead in uh, to the next question, which was how do you, how can you tell when it's time to transfer up, you know, to upsize to a larger pot? Yeah. Um, usually I, I can tell when the roots are just like escaping a pot. Um, can you hand me that philodendron actually? So this, this is a good example. You'll see that this plant is humongous, like she's doing well. But um, she's toppling over. Yeah, there's she's kind no, of wobbling. There's no support for her. Uh, that's because she's not deep enough in the soil. And you'll see that the roots here and from the bottom are escaping. They're trying to find new soil, trying to find mo more moisture. Um, we just got this plant in, but we're definitely repotting her ASAP because um, she's outgrown her pot and she's ready to go to the next level. So. Um, She's going usually, to college. Yeah, she's going to college. Usually you can tell um, just by, if you feel like it's time to repot, then it's usually time to repot. Um, just go incrementally higher. Don't go from a four inch pot to a 10 inch pot. Mm -hmm. From Go from a four inch to a six inch and from a six inch to an eight inch. Um, go slow and uh, your plant will adjust to and, its yeah, new. And don't rush the, home. Don't rush the process. Um, a lot of times people will ask like, I just got the plant. Um, do I need to replant it in something bigger? What do I do? What do I do? Um, most often you can, you can kind of let it chill and develop um, its own. Um, I mean, if it, if it just like that example we showed you, if it's toppling over or if it's suddenly like sick and not looking as good, then then it's time to start like problem solving. Like maybe I need to transplant it. Maybe I need new soil. Maybe it's sick. Um, so yeah, I, in, instinctively don't just like try to get it like in a bigger pot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just let it do its thing. So repot, but don't repot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, I know we're on probably a little bit of borrowed time here. Um, maybe if we could just squeak one more in, which um, a question came in, should we regularly spray plants with insecticidal soap or is it more on an as-needed basis? Yeah, it's more on an as-needed basis, I would say. It's, it's uh, prescriptive rather than yeah. it's reactionary, not proactive. It, it also, um, the the insecticidal soap, it smells. <laughs> so like, I mean, it, 
will just stink up your place. Um, so you don't need to do that unless your plant is sick. But um, if you're very yeah. anxious, then maybe just do it like, you know, missed it. And once a month. Maybe, maybe do it like, yeah, once a month. But think of it as like an antibiotic. Uh, you don't want to take an antibiotic just because like you have a little bit of a sniffle. I mean, maybe now you do, but, uh, <laughs> but an antibiotic will completely kill all of the bacteria in your system, including the good bacteria. So an insecticidal soap will do that same thing. It'll leach out all of the good nutrients in the soil that have been kind of developing over time. Um, and you'll have to start from scratch, which will then affect the longevity of your plant. So um, go easy on the insecticidal soap. If you see a pest, definitely go for it. But yeah. if there's nothing wrong, then don't worry about it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I did want to remind everyone that attended that there is going to be a prize for uh, joining the workshop, which is going to be a fiddle leaf fig. So keep an eye on our social media at National Office Furniture Instagram. Um, to see who the winner is. That should be happening um, by early next week at the latest, and we'll also contact you directly just um, so no one misses it. Um, just a big thank you to Mike and Kat. This is super informative, and I know I learned a lot, um, and we hope you will all join us for our...